And so we just want to welcome Dr. Martin to be here with us and uh, go ahead and use the chat box if you have questions. We'll try to pay attention to that and I will turn it over to you. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, Jessica, and I want to thank all the participants who are here with us. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A and kind of give an overview of farm labor in California. But much of what I'm going to say would apply across the United States. And as for those of you who just heard, the three takeaways are on the here bottom of the slide, that is, in 2030, we're going to have a lot more machines out in the fields and a lot more mechanical aids that make farm workers more productive. We're going to have fewer and more skilled workers in the fields. A higher share are likely to be guest workers under the current H-2A program or some new program. And those guest workers are going to be young. They're going to be more productive than the average uh, U.S. workers. But in, And the third big thing is we're going to have more imports. It's already true that over half of our fresh fruit, about a third of the fresh vegetables are imported, and Mexico is the largest source of fresh fruits and vegetables. One thing to keep in mind is there are about 750,000 Mexican workers employed on Mexican farms that export to the U.S. There's about 2 million Mexican-born workers on U.S. farms. So you can see that if there were no imports from Mexico, presumably, and we still had the same fruits and vegetables and did not come from Chile, Peru, or Central America, or somewhere else, there would be more Mexican born workers in the US. But back to the beginning, California has been the number one farm state since 1950, primarily because the state produces fruits, vegetables, and horticultural specialties, which are everything from nursery plants to flowers to mushrooms to cannabis. The number two state in agriculture is Iowa, and California's farm sales are roughly twice uh, the Iowa farm sales. California employs an average of about 425,000 farm workers, so that's average employment, and the way to think about that is a kind of a year-round equivalent job. But just as a McDonald's might have 20 job slots, but then issue 40 W-2 statements at the end of the year because people work a couple of months and then move on to somewhere else, that's kind of the same picture in agriculture in California. The number of unique workers is about twice the average job slots. So if we have 425,000 job slots, year-round equivalent jobs, we have 850,000 farm works. What that really usually reflects, uh, meatpacking plants are often like this, fast food restaurants. Some people come, they stay with agriculture. Other people come, work for 30 days or less, and then move on. So it's not that you can, you can have 80% of the workers who are committed and stay in the sector and still have very high turnover. What makes California different is that it's got this large fruit and vegetable sector, and that means roughly one third of everything in farm labor is in California. So it's roughly a third of average employment in US agriculture. The higher workers in California are like everywhere else, but what makes California in the US as a whole, about 70% of workers, according to the National Ag Worker Survey, were born in Mexico. In California, it's higher. It's about 90%. And Remember, if you are a foreign-born farm worker, then the chances are you're not authorized to work in the U.S. So for the U.S. as a whole, 70% Mexican-born, 70% of those Mexican-born workers are not, auth are not authorized. So if you remember your fractions, 0.7 times 0.7 means 0.49, and that means half of U.S. Uh, um, uh, NAS workers are not authorized. In California, the, the Mexican-born share is higher, and that's why the unauthorized is higher. Those unauthorized workers are aging, they're settled in one place, they have U.S.-born children, and we'll come back to the mechanization uh, issue and the other things at the end. If we look at farm labor, we've got unique demand for labor, unique supply of labor, unique labor market operation. The, the starting point is always the biological production process. It's not an engineering process, it's biological. You're producing perishable commodities, therefore there's seasonality and other factors that come into play. 
And there's also long been unique human resources in US agriculture. Employers tend to be older, white, and US citizens. So the average farmer is about 60, and over 90% of farm operators are white. Employees historically have always been younger. The average US worker is 42. Uh, so farm workers have traditionally been younger. They've been more likely to be Hispanic and they're more likely to be immigrants born in another country. So the, 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 the nature of both employers and employees is different. And of course the labor market operates differently. Uh, the ag labor market has a very high share of labor contractors and other intermediaries who organize workers into crews and move them from farm to farm. Already mentioned seasonality. The tradition has been that it's easier to monitor how much work people do than it is to um, uh, monitor how hard they're working. And so if you pay piece rate wages, you're paying people for the amount of work that they do. And piece rates are still relatively common in harvesting jobs. There have been a lot of efforts over in the past to sort of transform the farm labor market. So it'd be a totally different thing. In the 1970s, the idea was that unions and collective bargaining agreements would turn the farm labor market into something like longshoring. So if you remember the way the longshoring business works is you're a member of a union, you get seniority with the union, you show up at the union hiring hall and the union hiring hall tells you where to go to work. The United Farm Workers Union tried that in the 1970s before computers, it did not work because families got split up and all kinds of things. And basically the UFW peaked at about 200 contracts in the late 1970s. It's had about 20 contracts, a little less than 20 over the last two decades in the 21st century. So unions went from something that everyone expected to spread from California to Florida, places in between, to something that is important on some individual farms, but is not any kind of statewide or nationwide impact. In the 1980s, the theory was legalization of the unauthorized would transform the ag labor market. The whole theory was that things aren't so good in the farm labor market, but if we just gave workers legal status, then that would transform agriculture. Well, we know what happened. We legalized 1.1 million unauthorized workers under the Special Agricultural Worker Program. They got a, most of them, it was a lot of fraud. Many of them never worked in ag. A lot of them got out and they were replaced by unauthorized newcomers who came uh, in the 1990s. In the year 2000, about one out of four, almost one out of four crop workers in the US had arrived, was unauthorized and had arrived in the previous 12 months. So now we're in the 2020s and the big story is a repeat of what I said before. We're gonna have a lot of mechanization and mechanical aids, more guest workers and more imports. If we look out to 2030, it's hard to predict the future, but I suspect we're gonna have similar employer and employee profiles. It is employers older than average, employees younger than average. I think we will have a higher percentage of either year round or long season jobs, more skilled workers. But I guess I expect more of all three. I expect more machines out there, more guest workers and more imports. So just a few, for those of you not from California, just remember California is a big place. It's roughly a hundred million. I think we're the third biggest state after Alaska and, and Texas. There's about 100 million acres. The federal government owns well over half of California's farmland. But the important takeaway is that red area is the irrigated high quality farmland. And you can see it's a relatively small share. It's 8% of the total land mass of California. So most of California, of course, is not farmable at all. And it's a relatively small slice of land where the agriculture is concentrated. The biggest issue, of course, is that in order to have these high value fruits and vegetables, you need to have water because the state is basically arid. Um, most places in the state get relatively little water. And what's been happening is that it used to be a major crop in the San Joaquin Valley, that red heartland of California was cotton. So if there wasn't enough water, you don't plant it that year. Now, the major the major crop is almonds, so trees, and the trees, of course, need water year after year. So that's called a hardening demand for water. You can't just cut down the trees one year and plant them next. You need to give them water year after year if you're going to have a crop. And the issue that California has is that the water is in the far north, in, and the agriculture 
is in the center and in the south, or the people were in the south. And so we have these huge dams in the north, and they were built to store winter, the, the, the melting snow. So the precipitation arrives as snow in the winter. And in some places you get 80 or 100 feet of snow in a typical winter. And then as it melts in the summer, it flows into these dams, which then allow the rivers to take it into the delta where the uh, San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers come together. And then huge pumps there lift that water and carry it south. So the biggest user of electricity in the world is the California water system. It generates most of its own electricity. And the joke always is, can you pump water uphill? And the answer is, of course you can, but it takes an enormous amount of energy to do it. The problem with the water system is that it was based on a smaller agriculture and a smaller population. And it was also based on precipitation coming as snow. Now that we have climate change, we're getting less of that winter precipitation of snow, more as rain. And that means it can run off in the winter and go out into the ocean. We're also having a problem of these big pumps killing the fish that move between salt and fresh water. And so there are all these proposals to build huge underground uh, uh, systems to move the water around the delta to preserve the fish. We haven't done any of that yet, but this whole business of is the, is the system sustainable uh, hinges us a lot on what we do with water. Some people say uh, there's talk, move to Mexico for water. That's really a non-starter. Mexico is also an arid place. One thing to keep in mind is if you go to Baja, California, which is a major source of berries, and fresh vegetables part of the year, there are something like 100 desalination plants. So we're desalinating water, typically not straight seawater, it's often from wells that's brackish, but we're desalinating water in order to grow uh, fruits and vegetables, which is something that historically never would have been done. After all, water has to be cheap. You're dumping it on the ground and it, it has to be uh, relatively cheap. But if you go and visit the farms that are producing there, you'll notice they're very economical in their water use. Lots of drip irrigation, so water doesn't get wasted. But back to talking about fruit and vegetable agriculture, we're really talking about production of most fresh fruits and vegetables from big farms. So USDA has various ways of classifying farms, and they call um, big farms those that sell at least a million dollars worth of farm commodities every year. And you'll notice that it's cotton, dairy, and specialty crops is their name for fruits and vegetables. Most of the production come from big farms. If we wanna to go to small farms, you go to chicken farms, hay farms, a lot of beef farms are small, but fruits and vegetables are primarily from large farms. And what makes California stand out, of course, is the, the high farm sales. I mean, if we look at three counties in California, Fresno, Kern, and Tulare, they're at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, that red part of irrigate. They each have farm sales of somewhere in the order of seven or $8 billion a year. And that's more than most states. I mean, a state like Pennsylvania has farm sales a little over $8 billion a year. Uh, New York is around six. So you have individual counties uh, that often have as much in farm sales as another state. And once again, it's not that it's a lot of land, it's the type of commodity that's produced that's really high value. So if we look at farm labor, the agriculture is divided by the government into a 30 different sectors. So eggs is a sector, uh, um, broiler chickens is a sector. But for all practical purposes, five sectors are the ones that dominate for farm labor. And this would be true for the United States as well as for California. The most important is what the government calls crop support. So what's crop support? There are non-farm employers who bring workers to farms. The biggest single category within that is farm labor contractors. Second are fruits and nuts, then comes vegetables and melons, then comes greenhouse nursery, and finally dairy. Those five sectors account for about 90% of farm employment wages in California, around 70, 75% in the United States. The crop support, as I've said, is mostly labor contractors. It's not all labor contractors. It's, it's custom, custom combining crews. It's people who apply pesticides, et cetera. But labor contractors are the, are the big one. And the one huge puzzle 
in labor contracting is in theory, labor contracting should benefit both workers and employers because after all, if I'm a seasonal worker, instead of me driving around looking for jobs, it's much more efficient if somebody lines up a whole series of jobs for me. So in theory, uh, and the same for the farmer, uh, if the farmer can call a labor contractor, he or she doesn't have to go out and recruit workers. In theory, labor contracting improves efficiency in seasonal labor markets. In practice, if there are lots of violations, labor law violations in a labor market, then contractors can wind up being the, the risk absorbers for those violations. And so that's been a perennial issue. How do you think about labor contractors as intermediaries who benefit both workers and employers or as businesses that act as risk absorbers uh, if there are violations. Labor contractors are most common uh, when a, a short season task needs to be done on a particular farm and harvesting tree fruits is an example. This is also an example of where you use piece rate wages because it's much easier to monitor how many bins of oranges or apples I've picked than it is to watch me working in trees where I might not be easily observable. So piece rates get paid when it's easier to measure the output of a worker than the effort of that particular worker. The number one uh, uh, employer in, uh, by commodity in California is strawberries. I mean, the average employment is in the order of 25,000 that's directly hired workers. And remember that two to one ratio means if you've got an average employment of 25,000, you're hiring 50,000 uh, or more unique workers sometime during the year. Grapes are the second most important uh, commodity. And you know, there's three different time, uh, types, table grapes, raisin grapes, and wine grapes. Wine grapes are 90% mechanized. They're only hand harvested for some high value premium grapes in Napa or Sonoma. Um, but table grapes uh, are, are typically uh, picked and packed by hand. Raisin grapes, about a third are done with some kind of mechanization, but grapes have been a far more important employer in the past. Uh, raisin grapes will likely shrink due to imports and mechanization. Table grapes uh, are in something of a boom because they're developing uh, new varieties and people are consuming more of them. But if you so just sort of think about it is, while vegetables and melons are important, fruits and nuts employ far more farm workers. Uh, part of the, you have to be a little careful with the data because if workers are brought to a farm by a labor contractor, we don't know what commodity they work in. But labor, and labor contractors can be common in both fruits and vegetables. But fruits, in all the studies that I've seen, fruits always employ more workers uh, than do vegetables. So we've got crop support, fruits and nuts, vegetables, then greenhouse and nursery uh, employs a lot of people, but uh, this is a sector in which many of the people uh, are year round. So there's less of that turnover. And yes, even cannabis uh, in the lower right figures as one of those nursery and greenhouse employment. And finally, dairy in California, uh, I think is the number one dairy state. So we've got uh, a little under 20,000 people employed in dairy. But the main takeaway is those five sectors employ over 90% of the workers and account for 90% of the wages. And if we looked at other states, we would have something very similar. The, with the exception being that if we are in that Midwestern beef belt with uh, Texas, Nebraska, Kansas and stuff, beef would play a much larger role. But still dairy employment, even in some of those, like in North Texas, there's a big and expanding dairy sector, uh, dairy employment can be quite high. In, we, we used to think always of farmers hiring workers directly, but now when you see a group of people in a field in California, chances are they've been brought to the farm by a crop support employer. So over the last decade, more workers were brought to farms by these non-farm employers, that's the red line, than were hired directly. That's not true in the US. For the US as a whole, the blue line is on top of the red line, but it's moving in the same direction in the rest of the United States. So when you think of who the employer is, 
remember the employer of the workers in a field may not be the operator of that particular farm. Increasingly, the employer of the worker is, is a non-farm employer. Technically, labor contractors are non-farm businesses that bring workers to farms. I've already emphasized this two to one ratio between average employment and number of unique workers. So the state of California did this huge data exercise of running through all workers reported by an employer with an ag code. So including labor contractors and stuff. And that's where you can see consistently two things. One is average employment and number of workers is actually going up, not down. Why is that? Because of the huge expansion of labor intensive commodities like berries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, and other things. Uh, and then secondly, the, the ratio of two unique workers for each job has been pretty constant uh, over the last, um, over this period when they did it. So we did it three years. We'll be doing it again, EDD will be doing it again. And so I hopefully will have new numbers for 2021 or 2020, 2021 fairly soon. One question we always get from the media is, if you look at the wages that are paid and the number of year-round or full-time equivalent jobs, ag jobs look like they pay pretty high wages. So if I just divide for all of agriculture, the total wages paid by the average employment, I get a little over $30,000. This is for California. And then the question becomes, well, why don't people take $30,000 a year jobs? Uh, well, the answer is because you don't actually get $30,000. You get about half as much. And the reason for that is the $30,000 number is accurate, but it's accurate for a full-time equivalent worker. And most people are not full-time equivalent workers. Remember that seasonality. Uh, typically, a, a farm worker is going to work somewhere between a, you know, a full work year in the United States is considered 50, 40 hour weeks or 2000 hours. Most farm workers are gonna work somewhere in the order of 1000 to 1500 hours. And so if you, because of seasonality, you are go not going to earn what a full-time equivalent worker would earn. And you also may not get uh, as high an hourly wage. And you'll notice on the far right, the biggest gap between what a full-time worker would earn and what workers actually earn, this was 2015 data for California, the biggest gap is for farm labor contractors. So a full-time worker would have earned something on the order of $23,000, $24,000. The average earnings of farm labor contractor employees was in the order of $10,000 uh, in 2015. So who are the workers we already mentioned? They're typically unauthorized men, uh, about three-fourths of all crop workers in the NAS are men. They were born in Mexico. Many arrived in the U.S. in the 1990s and until the 2008-9 recession. You know, a typical age was early 20s, and what that means is now many of those same workers are in their 40s and 50s. Most are settled in one area. They have one employer during the course of a year, but remember that employer could be a farm labor contractor who moves them from one farm to another. One universal is that the, uni the US educated children of farm workers tend not to follow their parents into the fields. Yes, you can interview some children of farm workers who are in community college and lettuce fields in Salinas, but in general, most children of farm workers tend to shun seasonal jobs. I remember when we went into high schools in ag areas uh, and offered to help people with their math homework or whatever, how to get into UC, people sometimes had, you know, 16, 17 year olds sometimes had very exaggerated notions that they could be soccer stars or something, but they were almost universal in saying, we don't want to follow our parents or our uncles into the fields because we see what that does to your body when you're 40 or 50 years old. Remember that the NAS is showing that over half of farm worker families, about 60%, get some means-tested benefits. What that, that's typically for the 
US born children in farm worker families. The NAS tends to find a fairly long season uh, uh, workforce that is working lots of hours a year. Um, and it used to be the most recent uh, data, now they have 2017, 2018 data, but a typical thing uh, back when I did some farm work was you know people aimed to earn $100 in a good day. Now that's much more like $150. Um, but it gives you a wage of somewhere, personal earnings of somewhere in the $20,000, $25,000 uh, a year kind of range. But I think the important takeaway is that for most farm workers, farm work is pretty much like non-farm work. You don't live on the farm where you work, you commute to work, usually in a carpool, and you've got one farm employer during the year. There's exceptions to every rule, about eight or 9% of workers live on the farm where they work, they walk to work. But it, in general, the most important thing is working on a farm is like working in a factory or somewhere else. You live away from the farm, you, get, you carpool to work, and at the end of the year, you're getting one W-2 statement. The big story at the, uh, in farm work is the aging of the workforce. So it used to be that workers tended to drift out of farm work in their 40s because of the physical demands of the work. Now we're having uh, lots of farm workers in their, um, in their 40s and 50s. In fact, the NAS says one sixth of all crop workers are um, 55 and older. Remember, the NAS does not include H2A workers, and if they were included, that would pull the average age down. Most of the unauthorized workers have U.S.-born children, and remember, the benefits often go to those U.S.-born children. Just a word about COVID. There was a lot of discussion that COVID, because farm workers have lower than average incomes, often live in crowded housing, that COVID would sweep through farm worker areas and leave a whole lot of sick workers and lots of labor shortages. It didn't happen. I mean, one of the big stories that somebody should look at is why there was so little COVID among farm workers rather than why. So maybe it's because people were working outside. Maybe it's because employers did get very aggressive to try to take steps in order to reduce COVID at work. There were COVID outbreaks, but if you really look at where COVID happened, it happened in the food system, but it happened a lot in meat and food processing. Those are non-farm jobs, not farm jobs. And that's where we had lots of COVID outbreaks. One of the, the big stories was how few people used special programs uh, that would have allowed them to quarantine away from home and everything else. But we mostly wanna focus on what's likely to happen in the 2020s looking forward, what's likely to happen in the farm labor market? And then how does that affect the, um, the workers and families that many of you are serving? Well, the big story, of course, is not the federal government raising minimum wages, but it's state governments raising minimum wages. So most US workers live in states that have a minimum wage that is more than the federal minimum wage. And many of those states, including California, index their state minimum wage so that it goes up with inflation. So California's will go up to 1550 uh, next year. Those rising labor costs are driving these three major trends, mechanization and aids to make workers more productive, H2A workers and imports. And so if we look at each of them in turn, a lot of things that people said in, a lot of things in agriculture people said could never be mechanized have in fact been, me been mechanized. And we're seeing a new wave of private venture capital coming into agriculture that's seeking ways to mechanize particular tasks. So the biggest labor user is typically harvesting, but private money wants a big return. So much of the private money is going into, to go back one, much of the private money is going into activities that can be used across a whole lot of crops. So for example, there's been a lot of work on thinning and weeding of crops because that you can automate in a whole lot of different crops where if we develop a machine to pick carrots or olives, it's gonna be a different machine for each commodity. And, and so it's, when private money is looking for a big return, it looks for what is the largest acreage 
commodity where we can sell the most machines. Uh, to give you an example, which I think we already went through, there are only seven major cantaloupe growers left in California. And there is actually a machine that could pick cantaloupes. And, but I've calculated that even if you sold all the machines so they could pick all the cantaloupes in California by the machine, you'd sell about 30 of them. Now think about that. What profit margin would you need to justify developing a machine that can pick the ripe cantaloupes, not damage the ones that aren't ripe yet, et cetera? I mean, there's just not, the market is not big enough to justify the kind of investment that would be required to mechanize something, a, a fragile and perishable fruit. That's why we don't have an asparag a mechanical asparagus harvester yet, et cetera. The market is too small to justify the, the amount of investment that they required. When you talk to the people in agrobotics, many of them are places like Carnegie Mellon, and you know, of course the biggest funder of the kind of robotics that we're looking at in agriculture is the military. And in the military, the basic idea is it's about performance, not cost. Spend $10 million, save a soldier. In agriculture, it's about cost, not performance. You don't have to get every apple off the tree. But what you do need to do is have a machine that will pick the apple, do it cheaply, not bruise it, and be durable. Because in agriculture, we've got a lot of dust and a lot of changing conditions. Here's a little thing that a little device it originally, this was a hundred thousand dollar device to move plants around. That didn't sell. They finally stripped it down and got it to about twenty five thousand dollars. And now it is being adopted by lots of nurseries. But the main thing with mechanization in agriculture is this need to get low cost and durability. Um, and then the other thing is, do you have the machine adapt to the current way the crop is grown, or do you change how to grow the crop to make it easier for the machine? So in other words, should the machine pick individual strawberries, which is you know, what machines that are trying to design machines to do? The, another alternative would be to, instead of picking the strawberries into clamshells in the field, pick them into bins, workers could pick faster, and put them in clamshells once you get them to a packing house. The way you see this mechanization coming most is what the government calls controlled environment agriculture. So this is basically any kind of a building that protects growing plants. It doesn't have to even be a building. Uh, in many cases, it's just a, a hoop with plastic over top of it, but that is a CEA system. And CEA is probably one of the fastest growing parts of agriculture because with controlled environment agriculture, you can produce closer to the consumer, so you cut transport costs. You can get much higher yields. Yields in CEA can be 10 times higher. It's much more efficient in use of water, et cetera. But of course, photosynthesis, photosynthesis is the basic building block of agriculture, and you often have to use artificial lighting to get plants to uh, uh, go through their photosynthesis. And so the, the energy cost can be much, much higher, but CEA is spreading. And with CEA, you can build automation right into the production process. Uh, and so it winds up converting farming almost into more factory operations. So mechanization is coming. The other thing that's coming is mechanical aids which make workers more productive. You all know that most fruits and vegetables are over 90% water. So what you're really doing is carrying water. If you can figure out a way to cut, reduce the lifting and carrying of workers, you can accommodate older workers and workers can work faster. Now, it's not always easy when they use these platforms that raise and lower workers and therefore eliminate ladders. Instead of picking into my own bin, I'm now picking into a shared bin. So that means we have to go from each person wanting to say, I want my five bins today or my four bins today, to now saying, we as four people are gonna pick our 16 or 20 bins today. And so, you know, 
the faster pickers may be, may be helping out the slower pickers, but it's, so sometimes introducing mechanical aids can be difficult, but it is the kind of thing that's spreading as the cost of technology comes down, as workers get older and as labor costs rise. So you're seeing this in table grapes. So table grapes is an expanding sector because people are developing proprietary varieties that are sweeter and consumers like them. The old way was to cut those bunches of grapes, put them in these plastic tubs and then use a kind of a wheelbarrow device to take them to packers at the end of the row. Well, a robot can do that. And if a robot can take it from the picker to a packer at the end of the row, that robot could also take it to a packing house where you could put technology to work and pack those table grapes into clamshells or bags or something else in a packing house. So the first big change that's coming is mechanization, but also mechanical aids. And those mechanical aids are a place where there, there, there could be opportunities for upskilling of workers. The second, of course, is the H-2A guest worker program. Uh, 317,000 jobs certified last year. We were up, we're up so far this year by a sixth. So we may get up to about 350,000 this year. Remember that some employers don't follow through. Some workers are able to do, to fill two of those jobs, but by and large, H-2A visas go to Mexicans and they're in the U.S. an average of six months. So we've gone, we've tripled from 100,000 to over 300,000 jobs. And if current trends continue, we'll be at about 450,000 jobs by uh, 2025. Why is that interesting? Because the peak of the Bracero program in 1955 was 455,000 jobs. So, at the, so if current trends continue, we'll be at the peak of the Bracero program in about three years. What's been happening is, is that the H-2A program is primarily a Southeastern program. The big states are Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, but farm labor is primarily a West Coast phenomenon. So if you look at the distribution of farm employment or farm wages, California, Oregon, and Washington are about half. California is about a third and then Washington and then Oregon. And so the growth in the H-2A program is gonna be primarily in the Western states. It's, it's already true that H-2A workers pick most of the oranges in Florida and they're very important in vegetables, tobacco and other things in Georgia and the Carolinas. So the growth is likely to be away from the Southeast and in other areas, not just the West Coast, but throughout the whole United States. If we look nationally at how things are changing, the fruits and vegetables account for over two thirds of all the H-2A job certifications and their share is growing as you know there are, there are sheep herders and detasseling crews and all that sort of thing but the fruit and vegetable share of H2A is going up but the important thing to notice is that in this slide the yellow are the H2A jobs and fruits that go to labor contractors and the gray are the H2A jobs in fruits that go to individual farm employers and you can see the H-2A, the labor contractor share in fruits is almost half, and it's over half, it's now orange in this slide, in vegetables. That's what's different about the H-2A program from the Bracero program. Under the Bracero program, it was mostly employer associations that brought in Mexican workers and housed them in dorm-like structures and move them from farm to farm. Now it's labor contractors who are bringing in H-2A guest workers. They're often being housed in motels and then being taken from farm to farm. They're, why do people use H-2As? Well, it's an economic decision. They cost more per hour, but there's a couple of advantages. First, H-2As are on average much younger. So the average age of an H-2A is about 31, 32. Remember the average age of a U.S. worker, remember typically unauthorized, is early 40s. Second, that means they're more productive. Whether it, you measure it in boxes or bins picked per hour per day, the productivity is somewhere between 15 and 30% higher. The third is H-2As are labor insurance. If I'm a U.S. worker, even an unauthorized worker, and I don't want to work for you today, I won't, I'll go work somewhere else. Whereas if I'm an H-2A worker, I have to do the work that I'm assigned because if I, 
my, if I'm terminated by the employer, I have to leave the United States. So there is a labor insurance aspect to it. And yes, H-2A workers cost more because the employer has to pay for transportation to the U.S. and housing, but employers don't pay Social Security and Medicare taxes on the wages of H-2As. That saves about eight or nine percent. And in many states, they don't pay on employment insurance taxes. So it's, you know, H-2As are more expensive, but they're also more productive and they provide labor insurance. And that's one of the reasons why they'll wind up, the program will wind up growing. The big uncertainty is whether there will be a major immigration reform again. So the Farm Workforce Modernization Act is essentially IRCA all over again. So what IRCA did was legalize the unauthorized, change the H-2A program. What the Farm Workforce Modernization Act does is legalize the unauthorized, change the H-2A program. Granted, there are some differences. Um, the, you know, it was 90 days you had to have done farm work in one year for SAW. Now it's 180 days in the previous two years and the, to become a certified ag worker. But the takeaway, and then in um, IRCA, you did not have to continue to do farm work. Now you're gonna have to continue to do farm work for four or eight years. But whether people will do that work or just buy documentation that they did is to be seen. The H-2A changes would be three-year visas, allowing H-2As in year-round ag jobs, freezing this adverse effect wage rate and studying it, and then finally requiring farm employers to use E-Verify. The basic idea of IRCA was give ag a legal workforce. The basic idea here is, once again, give ag a legal workforce. I don't think the Farm Workforce Modernization Act is likely to pass. We've been having some version of this for the since a long time, since the late 1990s, it used to be called ag jobs and then it was called blue cards. It went through a whole lot of different iterations, but the basic idea was always the same, legalize the unauthorized, make it easier to hire legal guest workers. Instead, I think what's more likely is changes that can be made without big, without a new bill being, or new law being passed by Congress. One of the things that, sh that I think should be done is, to rate employers, good employers, bad employers, give them an ABC system. And if you're a good employer, you should be able to be certified to hire H-2As for several years. And if you're a good worker, that is you abide by the terms of the program, you should be able to get a multi-year visa. And, and it's really crazy that we have a system where every year, several hundred thousand Mexicans leave their villages, they take a bus to Monterey or Tijuana or someplace. They wait around for three days to get an H-2A visa. And then they get on another bus and spend 20 hours getting up to Yakima, Washington. I mean, if we could give multi-year visas to workers, they could simply fly and save all that wear and tear on their bodies. Uh, uh, the thing to keep in mind is it's uh, at the peak days in Monterey, we're interviewing between two and 3,000 H-2A workers, I mean, we're not interviewing them all. They're interviewing one out of 100. And sure, they eventually catch somebody who had a DUI or something, but it is a crazy system that we put people through and it has really limited benefits for the government, but it certainly increases costs for both workers and employers. The second thing to think about is we could do a lot more turnkey labor. So some, you know, the basic idea is, is that you want trained, experienced workers who can arrive and go right to work. Uh, and if the worker knew that he or she was coming back year after year, that would give him or her an incentive to learn English and skills and be even more useful and earn a higher wage uh, with the employer. And then the third and final thing, you know, we have 16,000 H-2A applications a year. They come from about 10,000 unique employers. But Many of the, the abuses we see in the H-2A program are from relatively small operators, somebody who's bringing in 10 or 20 or 30 workers and trying to fly under the radar. The big employers tend to have trained staff, standardized procedures, compliance departments. They're trying to, I think, most of them trying to operate in ways that do comply with laws. Now, there are always exceptions to every rule. And we know with the Blooming Onion investigation in, um, in Georgia and other places that uh, there are some big players who can get, who, who do abuse workers. But if we had some way of doing 
ABC ratings and giving benefits to A rated and did a lot more training in the off season and, favor and, and, and favored uh, larger ones, I think we could do something to help keep the H2A program from becoming associated with exploitation and other things. I mean, I do think for most workers, most of the time, the system works, although there is a much too high share of those for whom there are real problems. So we've talked mechanization, um, we talked guest workers, now imports. I already mentioned 60% of our fresh fruit, and keep in mind that's bananas and tropical fruit as well, a third of the vegetables uh, are imported and Mexico is the biggest source of both fruit and vegetable uh, imports to the US. The big three imports from Mexico are tomatoes and avocados and berries. And remember 60% of all the fresh tomatoes we eat are imported in Mexico. Few come from Canada, but most come from Mexico. If you look at what's produced in Mexico and then what share of that comes to the United States. I mean, remember Mexicans eat a lot of tomatoes as well, eat a lot of avocados as well, but on some commodities, most of what's produced in Mexico is exported to the United States. Why? Because we're willing to pay more for those commodities than Mexican consumers are. So Mexico is as it were kind of an extension of US agriculture because most of the farms in Mexico are either partnerships with the US farms or own, I mean, in some cases there are limits on land ownership. So there's usually some sort of a partnership. And this growth in Mexican ag exports might have some implications for agriculture more generally. So the United States has run an agricultural trade surplus, meaning we ship more to other countries than we import from them in agriculture since 1960. And Midwestern agriculture, most of US agriculture supports free trade. US farmers see more opportunities than threats when they look abroad. They want countries like Mexico to buy our, our pork and our beef and our soybeans and corn. Florida is the big exception. Florida fruit and vegetable agriculture got its start with the Cuban embargo in the early 1960s. And Florida competes directly with a lot of Mexican production. So Florida and the Southeast turn states generally are much more protectionist than California and the rest of agriculture. But imports, especially of fruits and vegetables from not just Mexico, it's also Chile, uh, Peru is a big one that's coming on strong. Are they going to wind up turning fruit and vegetable agriculture protectionist? So the US International Trade Commission is being pressured by members of Congress to look at a whole lot of different commodities and ask, uh, are these commodities coming in from Mexico? Are they being dumped, which means they're being sold at below the cost of production? Or are they being produced with forced labor in Mexico? You saw that in February, I think it was, we've stopped tomatoes from a few farms in Mexico because of uh, forced labor. Um, so we're going to get a lot more investigations of working wages and working conditions in Mexico. Uh, I'm part of a project that is surveying workers in Mexican export agriculture. And the biggest thing to keep in mind is there's almost 3 million hired farm workers in Mexico, 2.5 million in the U.S., but most of those Mexican farm workers are employed on farms that produce for the domestic market, for the Mexican market. The export agriculture is a totally different labor market for food safety reasons, for wages, and for everything else. And many of the media reports don't distinguish between farm workers employed on farms that produce for the domestic market and farms that produce for the export market. Our surveys of those workers on export farms in Mexico find that workers there are younger than the Mexican born workers in the US. They're also better educated because education levels are rising in Mexico. So remember that, that one authorized worker in his forties probably has only seven or eight years of schooling. Whereas an H2A worker coming in who's 32 would have nine years of schooling. And so would that 32 year old on an export farm in Mexico. So to sum it all up, Farm wages are rising faster than non-farm wages. 
the demand for farm workers has been relatively stable because as soon as we mechanize one crop, we expand another crop. And uh, the US workers are getting older, they're exiting. The big drivers of change in uh, the farm labor market have really come at the state level. Things like the rising minimum wage, uh, over, you know, the end of overtime exceptions for farm workers, COVID precautions. Right now, the average earnings of farm workers across the US are about $15 an hour, and the average earnings of non-farm workers across the US are about $25 an hour. So that means farm earnings are about 60% of non-farm earnings. However, the gap is narrowing. It used to be 50%. And if current trends continue, by 2025, we're probably looking at $20 farm wages and $30 non-farm wages. And if we that would be 67%, that would be the the highest farm earnings at the highest share of non-farm earnings, at least that I've ever seen since we've had data from the 1950s. In response to those high and rising costs, we're seeing these three, uh, these three things. One is mechanization and mechanical aids. You know, we can do it in raisin grapes, wine grape, blueberries is one that's going to mechanize relatively fast, I think, over the next five or 10 years. It's much harder to mechanize strawberries, cherries, you know, sweet cherries, table grapes, a lot of the leafy greens. There are the potential for mechanical aids, though, in things like apples and the conveyor belts that go in front of people harvesting lettuce and celery and everything else. The H2A changes, we could wind up seeing multi-year certifications. We could see more crews coming in in a turnkey fashion. We may move to uh, favor fewer and larger recruiters. Uh, it's hard to know exactly how that will evolve. And then finally, since I'm in the research business, if you want more, uh, just Google Giannini Foundation if you can get a whole lot on California agriculture. As Jessica mentioned, we do try to keep up with what's going on. Uh, if you go to migration.ucdavis.edu, uh, we have several things, but maybe just call your attention to, we started a new series of where we look at ag and labor in particular states. So we haven't done every state yet, but you know, we're basically bringing together data from the census of agriculture, from the unemployment insurance system, and from other sources to try to say, well, what is a, what is a, what does it look like uh, for ag labor in this particular state? And then the other thing we're doing is for some commodities, we're looking at alternatives to hand labor. So we've done strawberries, blueberries, apples, a bunch of them. There will be some more coming out on grapes. Uh, relatively soon. But once again, it's just a look at where do we stand now in hand labor in this commodity and what are the options going forward. So with that, let me stop and see if we have questions and we can have a discussion. So I guess I should stop sharing my screen, which I've done. And now I um, turn it back to Jessica. There are so many, <laughs> so much details you gave us there that are be super helpful. We have some questions in the chat more about like um, this idea if they have the visas for three years, they would still be coming and going. They wouldn't just be staying here the whole three years for H2A from what you're seeing, right? Or what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in the, in the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, they would grant three-year visas. A worker could stay as long as he or she was not unemployed more than 60 days. But the presumption would be that they probably would go back and forth. Yeah. Um, the big one that what I think would affect migrant service providers is opening up dairy. And many dairy farms do provide mobile homes and stuff. But if you started to bring in families on three-year visas, I mean, would they provide family housing? Um, because presumably you want to reduce turnover and that might wind up reducing the turnover that you would otherwise get if you, you know, I mean, it's, uh, otherwise three years can be a long time to be away from your family. And I mean, it can happen, but it's one of those things that, that I don't know. I mean, it, it's, when I sort of say my ABC system and multi-year visas, I was thinking of that as something within the current regulations, which are normally 10 month maximum. So I come, I work for my nine or 10 months, I go back, but then next year I come back again 
and I don't have to go through the consulate to come back. But so, so I, I think you could do it. I think you could do a multi-year visa without the year round. The year round would require, I think, legislation in Congress. Sorry, I muted myself there. All right, you guys, if you have questions, I know you're at, some of you have asked like specific states, I'd love to see, your, see Utah stats. Um, I know that the, um, I really, really like those, I think I put a comment on this. I forgot the name of it <laughs> that you sent out, the rural migration news. It always has a lot of, um, you guys also link a lot of articles and will mention different things happening in different states. So uh, I would suggest that people really see if they can get access to those and just sign up to, to get those to your, to your email. What specific questions do you guys have related to anything that he said today? I'm trying to look through to see if I'm missing any. Okay, there was a question on what do they do if they suspect abuse in wages or something like that? Any suggestions on, on where they should, who they should contact? I know Department of Labor you can contact, but who would you suggest? Well, I mean, it, the, this whole business of exactly how you enforce, I, I, I don't know if they're talking about just generally or H2As in particular, but enforcing labor laws in low wage labor markets is really hard. And it's really hard because we have only about a thousand federal investigators who enforce all labor laws in the United States. We have 8 million roughly employers. So they do, what is it? They do about a thousand investigations in agriculture a year. And about a third of the time they find no violations. And in two thirds of the time they find violations. But you know, if you've ever gone along with the investigators, it's a terrible job. You normally go a team of two and you see somebody working who looks underage and you say, how old are you? And they say, I'm 18 and the person looks 16. Well, how much, you know, are you gonna get dental records? Are you gonna, I mean, how much do you invest? I mean, I, I must say, I really, I, I wish I had a magic answer as to how to help fearful workers to report violations and how to get non-compliant employers to comply. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really hard question. Um, and, but clearly any labor commissioner, uh, legal aid groups, et cetera. I mean, you're supposed, H2A workers are supposed to get a brochure when they come in that's got all this contact information. And most H2A workers, at least uh, the NOS will have some information on this, but most of them actually have cell phones. I mean, the cell phone has probably been the number one empowerment tool of, of farm workers over the last several decades. Uh, and, and so, it, it does seem to me that if some group was going to do more to empower workers, it would be to distribute phones to people as they come across that are pre-programmed with uh, not, you know, with educational things, but also with contact information in case there are problems. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it depends on what kind of violations you're seeing, but like you said, cell phone is one of the best things to document what's happening. And so um, other questions, does it, I feel like you were really in depth and really explained really well. And, and are there any mechanizations that you've been surprised that are kind of, or anything that's getting ready to happen as far as any specific mechanizations in any particular area that you'll have, you think will have a big impact? Well, I think the, the ones to watch, as I've said, are, I mean, e each of these mechanization stories is complicated and, and you're, you're, the people in the field will know this from, from the particular commodities. Um, I mean, take apples, which are probably the biggest labor user in the United States. Um, on the one hand, if, if what we were producing was red delicious and golden delicious, we'd probably shake them off the tree because they're low value and they're, you know, a fair number of them go into processing, et cetera. But the problem is that people's preferences have shifted to Cosmic Crisp and Honey Crisp and all these high value ones. And they're actually more fragile. And of course the grower gets a lot more per pound. So 
the the fact that the consumers are switching the varieties that they prefer means that it's harder to mechanize. Whereas if everybody just had stuck with red and gold delicious, it would be much easier to mechanize. So it's it's it, it, every time you start peeling the onion, you discover that yes, new apple trees are being planted, you know, two-dimensional, train the limbs like in a vineyard so they grow. And that way they're easier for a machine to see them and they'll fall less far than they would in a high tree and they'll bruise less. But you still pick them by hand because if you pick by machine, you're gonna to have to throw away too many because they get bruised and damaged. So I, I think in the year 2030, we're gonna have a lot more machines out there because machines are coming and they're already being used commercially in New Zealand, which is a major apple exporter. But we, there's still enough labor here. And um, I mean, I know in the state of Washington this year, there's a company out of Israel that will be picking apples by machine at $30 a bin. Um, and that's a little higher than, than, you know, workers maybe get $28 a bin, but then on top of the of the 28 is benefits, et cetera. So it's coming, but it'll be slow. I mean, the ones to watch are blueberries because there's seven or eight companies making the machines and they, they're they improving the padding. So, so when you pick by machines, so, so this is the economics that we can go into as much as you want. But, you know, remember the idea is God made, a, or nature made a hundred apples on the tree. If we pick them by hand, our pack out rate's gonna be at 85, 90%. So we're gonna get them to the packing house, still throw out 10 or 15%. If we pick them by machine, the pack out rate might be 70%. We're gonna throw away 30. Now, it all depends on what the labor costs are. A 70% rate pack out rate could be more profitable than a 90% pack out rate. It all depends on what we're paying to get stuff done. A lot of farmers don't like waste. You know, God made a hundred apples. We wanna get a hundred apples out of there, even though of course that never happens. And so one of the ways to think about this in a food system is if we move toward mechanization, we're going to have a lot more throwaways. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. That, and machines damage things. And on the one hand, we want to reduce waste in the food system. But on the other hand, as we move toward mechanization, we're actually going to get more. I mean, you all know this in the vegetable industry, every year, we probably disc under five to 10% of the lettuce that's planted. We just never gets harvested. So the question is, why do we do that? Well, because somebody signs a contract with McDonald's to supply them with lettuce and the penalty for not supplying it, McDonald's is huge. And so I go ahead and I plant some lettuce in Arizona. I plant some lettuce in Mexico and stuff, which is insurance just in case there's a disease or a weather event and I can supply lettuce. So the system is kind of hard to sort of get your arms around this, but the system is built for waste. It's built for excess capacity. And there are logical economic reasons for that, but it still upsets a lot of people. And many times you'll see a field being disc under and people will attribute it to labor when in truth, it's, it's attributable to there's a low price. It's simply not worth harvesting. And sometimes that was planned from the beginning. I mean, sometimes it is due to labor, but, it, but you know, the, what you know, they say, the eighth wonder of the world is the supply response in agriculture. If you give farmers an economic incentive, they will certainly wind up supplying. We know that with corn and soybeans and everything else. Uh, so, so I think that's the, you know, that's why in looking at these, at mechanization options in these individual commodities. It was fascinating to get to the stories uh, and of, of why things can't change. I mean, and remember what I said, the average farmer is 60. So if we get to raising growers, the average farmer is in his high 60s. Oftentimes there's nobody to inherit the farm. And therefore, are you really going to, at that age, make a major investment so that you can do machines or are you going to ride it out until eventually it's going to become housing or almond trees or something? And so it turns out that these, these things get a little more complicated when you start getting down to the individual decision maker. Yeah, it's not just a, you know, yes, no, yes, we're seeing it. 
Maybe for the final question today, we have uh, a question more kind of on the migrant ed side of thinking, all right, you have workers coming. Is there anything that you're seeing that employers, there was a question specifically, it says, based on your experience, what kind of educational services do you think are most beneficial to agricultural businesses? That's kind of a, you know, anything that you see that they request or they're really wishing their workers knew or they had, you know, something that was accessible to them. Is it language? Is it OSHA related trainings? Anything like that? Number one thing is English. English. Uh, I mean, it's, it's over and over again. Um, you talk to workers, you know, a fair number of farm operators speak Spanish or have supervisors who speak Spanish, but there's an upper limit to how high you can go uh, without English. And so the number one thing would be, uh, I mean, the other skills are useful, you know, mechanical skills, welding, whatever, those are all useful things. But the number one thing that comes across the board over and over again is without English, there's a limit how high you can go. Sure, you can supervise a crew of 20 or 40 workers and you might even supervise a crew of irrigators and stuff. But especially when you get into equipment operation, you can, you can operate the equipment speaking Spanish, but if you're ever gonna understand it well enough to describe to a mechanic over the phone exactly what's wrong or something, you know, it's, it's over and over again, it comes back that English is probably the number one thing. Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's what we see as we're out in the fields and we have people, especially with the H2A workers, we see a lot of times the first thing they want is, hey, I need to, you know, I've got to go to the store and I need to know how to communicate. But that upward mobility in the actual job is real key too, that, that if we as migrant ed professionals can look at the individual needs of these workers and, and, and see most of us can see English is something that's requested over and over and over again. I, I know in meatpacking, some of the meat packers used to open up their training rooms before and after work shifts to allow local school districts to come in and to offer English. I mean, nobody had to do it. And I, I haven't heard much about that in agriculture, but it strikes me that with, you know, they've just opened a big H2A thing in Salinas, got a thousand or 1200 beds, and they've got you know, training room, community room. I mean, it, it would strike me that, that you've got the perfect opportunity where somebody could come in and offer things like English or, you know, whatever, how to navigate in the U.S. and stuff. Uh, and, and I don't know how much of an audience there would be. After all, people work hard, they're tired and all that sort of thing. But still, having it available, I think, would make it, would be a very useful thing to do. Yeah, that's the challenge of migrant ed's programs to try to make those connections and get in and, and, you know, see if there's a need and if they can try to meet that need. So thank you so much for your time. I think you've had lots of really good comments here in the chat box of how much people have enjoyed it. And for those that are on, if you guys will, we have an evaluation for overall for the, um, the Institute for this week. If you'll take time to kind of answer that for us today when you get done or whenever you want to, that will really help us. Included in there are things that you can have suggestions for what you might want in the future. So I just want to say a big thanks uh, for, for Phil for joining us and I'm going to stop the recording.